Hi there, it's me, Jordan Van Haslow. Welcome to Jordan Van Haslow and Friends live on Hot 702.5 FM Las Vegas. Let's get on with the show. Welcome to another episode of Show's Time with Jordan Van Haslow and Friends right here on Hot 702.5 FM Las Vegas. I am so excited to be sitting with a new friend. His name is Mark Putnam. He is a media strategist. He creates campaign ads. He's worked in the political sector for a very, very long time and has worked on countless amazing political ads and campaigns, um, notably spending many, many years with the Obama campaign team. He's uh, won so many awards and I'm not gonna go through all the awards because this is only an hour show and we probably go over time. <laughs> but he's also a, a founding partner of Putnam Partners, which is a media company that focuses on the areas, politics, issue campaigns, third bucket that I'm forgetting. Cor- corporate reputational. Work. Corporate reputation, yes. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And we're gonna learn a little about his background and we're gonna all get very, very well acquainted with each other. So without further ado, Mark Putnam, Welcome to Showtime. Oh, it's really great to be here, Jordan. Yeah, it's really great to have you. So you're like the king of of political campaigns and political ad campaigns. So I imagine that right now you're in a very, very, very busy season. Yeah, it it is pretty crazy at this time of year. I just got back from a shoot yesterday. Before that, I was on a four-day shoot in LA. Uh, it's, it's a lot of traveling, a lot of frequent flyer miles. Yeah, I can I can totally I can I can completely imagine. How does um how does in in is how how does um when it comes to um just your work and and the type of work that you do, how does um how do things change um while when we're in like the political season but then also when we're in the when when we're in the, when we're in the off season? Well, first, you know, there's it used to be that we were only busy in the even numbered years because most of the campaigns that you're familiar with, presidential, Senate races, governor races, most of them are in the even numbered years. But more and more, there's work in the odd numbered years, too. And for mayoral campaigns, there's a few states that have off off your off your elections. So we're always busy now, but we're really busy in the even numbered years. And it's it's a growing marketplace. I mean, more and more money is being spent on political ads, and and frankly, most of it's bad. <laughs> I, I'm going to go ahead and say that. Like, I don't like a lot of political advertising because you see the same old stuff. You know, the candidate in a hard hat at a work site, or a candidate talking to kids and reading them a book or something. And and so there are more and more firms doing that kind of work and more and more money being spent in it, which allows the work that we do to really stand out because it's a little bit different. We usually try to figure out a creative way to feature our candidate and that kind of, there's always demand for that, whether it be an even numbered year or an odd numbered year, there's always folks running that want to do something a little bit different. And so it keeps us busy. Yeah, I can imagine. So I I know really nothing about other than being like, Form voter. I really know nothing about the Beltway. I've actually only been to DC once, and that was a layover. So- <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> it's it's a city worth avoiding. Um, it's you know I, I I was trying to think because I was looking at some of your other interviews and your other friends and. Um, and they all come from, you know, much more glamorous Hollywood type productions. And there, someone once said that Washington is Hollywood for ugly people. So it's, it's <laughs> and and um, so it, it's I I felt I had to live here. You know, you know, when I, I graduated, I actually had a, got a d- degree in molecular biology, which has absolutely I nothing. Oh, that I was wondering, like, how does a nice little sa- scientist end up in the center of <laughs> politics? Well, <laughs> I, it started a long time ago when I was about 10 years old and I grew up in Alaska and most of the advertising, political advertising up there is is terrible. And as a 10 year old, I saw an ad that I thought was just ridiculous. It was a candidate handing out balloons to kids. And and so I, I as a 10 year old, I thought, well, that's that's terrible. And, and I just started watching political ads a little bit differently than most people do. And when I was in college, I thought I was going to end up in biotech and I was, you know, really working hard towards that degree when I p- would take a few political science or a few writing classes on the side and got involved in a few media projects just because I wanted a distraction from the science. And 
I realized that senior year that I didn't really want to go try to get a job in biotech and have to get an MBA someday and work on the business side with a science understanding. I'd rather go figure out how in the heck to get into this political advertising game. And I was really fortunate. I was the head counselor. I, I say that my life changed when I got a really bad room lottery number at the end of my sophomore year of college because I was I was assigned to this terrible dorm that I didn't want to be in. And so I ended up getting trans I got myself transferred into a freshman dorm. I said I was more than happy to live in a freshman dorm, even as an upper class person, as a junior. Um, if, if I could have a single and it was, it ended up being a great dorm and a great part of campus. And in that experience, I met the daughter of a woman, Geraldine Ferraro, who had run for vice president, uh, a, a few years earlier, back in 1984. And so I ended up asking her daughter, how does a person get into this? You know, here I am with a science degree, really no pre-professional training for it. How does a person get into this? And, she, and Laura was her daughter's name. And Laura said, I have no idea, but you should talk to my mom. And so my first informational interview was with a woman who had just run for vice president of the United States. And I said to her, I said, um, first, it was really nice to meet her. And she was great, really nice. And I said, should I go work on the Hill, uh, Capitol Hill? Should I go work for a regular ad agency? Should I go work on a campaign? She said, no, don't do any of those things. You should go work for a political media firm. They do exist. And back then, there were very few of them. And so I got an internship, uh, paid 100 bucks a week. Um, my kids don't like to hear me tell that hard luck story now, but a uh, hundred dollars a week and it didn't even pay my rent, but I was able to work in a firm that was doing a lot of big races. And so I was willing to make almost nothing, um, in order to see if I liked doing this. And, uh, the last thing I'll say about the science background is it actually has helped me in my job because our work is half of it's being creative, right? It's figuring out how you can tell a candidate story in a way that's different from most political advertising. Uh, but the other half is is being research driven and polling driven and, and all the data science that goes into it. So I have an appreciation for that. And, and I think that our best work is equally strategic and equally creative. And so you have to have a, a little bit of a science background to understand all that. That's my long answer to your short question. <laughs> Well, before we go forward in that, I'm so curious because I know you were born in Alaska, raised in Alaska, Anchorage, Alaska. You're only the second person I know. A really good friend of mine was was born and raised in Anchorage. Oh, really? And it always fascinated me because I grew up in Chicago and I've basically only lived in Chicago, New York, L.A., and Vegas. And so Alaska seems like literally like just so far in the middle of nowhere. And I know my friend and I, this is Dante Jose, my, you know, we'll talk about just what it was like growing up there and how he was just like, how the hell do I get to like the rest of the United States? So what what is that like kind of growing up in a place that, and again, I haven't been there. So, I mean, I could be completely like off the mark and how I imagine it, but I mean, you're literally separated from the the rest of the United States by another country. What's it like growing up there and watching television and thinking about, you know, what your future is going to be? Does it feel like, oh my goodness, going to like the continent, you know, the mainland United States, like, does it seem like just as like far-fledged as like, I'm going to grow up and move to Europe one day? Or It, it, <laughs> it does actually. So I was born one week before the great Alaska earthquake of 1964. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it was the second, it has been the second strongest earthquake ever recorded in human history. Oh, um, wow. 9.2 under Richter scale, which is about double what most California ones are, uh, even more than that. And so I was born one week before and my dad, when the earthquake started, he like ran into the room where my crib was and launched himself on top of the crib and rode it around the room for the five minutes of the violent shaking. So I had kind of a, a rocky welcome into the world. And when you live in a place like Alaska, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's a very conservative state, which has helped me because I've actually worked in a lot of conservative states in my career. But but growing up there, yeah, it, you kind of are always thinking, well, I want to live somewhere else. I want to move somewhere else. And as soon as you do move, then you realize everything that you missed about living in Alaska. Um, when I was growing up, we had no arena. We had no place for, you know, no venue for concerts. Ozzy Osbourne came to oil, came to Anchorage, Alaska and played in the West Anchorage High School gym. I mean, that was literally <laughs> the kind of place that you would perform because it could hold a few, you know, I don't know, 500 people or something. So you didn't really have a lot of music acts. 
there really back then was was no production going on up there. Now it's there's a lot of reality television being shot up there, but there wasn't when I was growing up. And you get used to having a mountain range right there, you know, five minutes out of town, or we had a big forest right right behind our house, and you you get you get used to that. And then when I went to college, I went in Rhode Island, very very different experience. And I suddenly realized, oh boy, it gets hot here in the summer, or it's very humid, or I don't have the mountains, I can't go hiking anymore, I can't go for long bike rides in the same sort of way. So you do kind of look elsewhere when you're growing up. And oh, and by the way, I should say, I never went to New York or Washington, D.C. You know, when I was growing up, we would go to sometimes to Hawaii because that was kind of our version of, of Florida or mm. we would go on the West Coast. But I, I never saw, you know, New York City. And so when I finally got to visit that my freshman year of college, it was pretty extraordinary. It's this kid from Alaska getting to see the Empire State Building. So, yeah, you have that perspective growing up. Yeah. So so you start and you start working for an agency and you realize, OK, this is the, this is, I'm on, I'm on the right path. I'm doing kind of what it is I want to do. So what's the next step for you? So I worked at that first firm for about eight months and they kind of like to push all the young kids out of the nest and have us go work on a campaign. So I actually worked for Joe Biden the first time he ran for president, uh, which was in 1987. And he didn't even make it into 1988 in that campaign. He had a a little plagiarism problem um, that I actually then and to this day think was an unfair attack on him. But uh, he got pushed out of the race early and it probably saved his life because he later it, that year, early 1988, he had an, an aneurysm in his head. And if he had been out campaigning for president, he would not have gotten the medical attention as quickly as he did. Uh, he had massive headaches and ended up uh, they they rushed him to the hospital and they opened up his head and his blood vessel and right uh, near near in his his temple ended up bursting uh, right there on the operating table. He would have died if he had been mm -hmm. running if he had stayed in the presidential campaign. So that was my first campaign actually that I worked on was Joe Biden for president in 1987, and I wanted to get right into another media firm after that. I didn't want to go work on another presidential campaign. Oftentimes, people will work for one candidate when they lose in the primaries, they might jump onto another candidate's campaign. I decided, no, I want to get back into that ad making game. I really wanted to explore what I could do. So I ended up getting a job in a really small firm. I was willing to answer the phones and do the books and send out the invoices and manage the office uh, in exchange for being able to go on shoots and be in the edit suite and spend a lot of time you know, watching the making of ads and ended up making ads myself pretty quickly. I realized that there's two types of people in production. One kind of person loves being in the edit suite, realizes that every second there's a decision being made, um, whether you're going to make an edit point one thirtieth of a second sooner or later, and how you're going to design the graphics and how you're going to, you know, what the what role the music plays in it. And I know you have a musical background. I used to play cello, so I could bring a lot of my own musical background into it. Uh, and then there are other people that will sit in the edit suite and it's like watching paint dry. Right. Like they're just so, it's very, very boring because they don't realize that there's a, there's something going on every moment. And so I found I was in that first category. I really loved it. And uh, so I was at that firm for a decade and became a partner, became, was creative director, became a partner in the firm. Two of us split off and formed our own firm. And I was with that agency for 14 years. And now I've had this one, uh, the agency I founded in, in 2011. I've had this now going on my 14th year. So I am unusual in politics, uh, and it's like this in entertainment, I would think you're kind of, it's always job to job to job, uh, mm -hmm. and people often work in campaign to campaign. I've had real stability in, in that I've been able to work now for with three different agencies for long periods of time, and nowadays everybody you know is jumping around in their career. I've been pretty stable, which is, which is unusual and and. and, and I'm glad I'm glad it's been that way. It's worked out. Well, it's a blessing, right? Like how often? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Do you what what is it that you find? I mean, aside from the editing and like t telling the story, what is it that you um, would really draws you to what, what it is you do? Is it the fact that there's just these really um, larger than life dynamic people just like battling it out in front of the world? Is it about you know, the idea of participating in democracy and making the change? Is it just the, the the production aspect, right? Like I know a lot of people who work in physical production who they don't care if it's a documentary, they don't care if it's a script, they just like the environment, they just like the work. What is it about, what is it that, that draws you? 
That's a great question. I think for me, initially, it was a little bit of the star factor. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, and you're looking at these political figures and back then, they honestly, there's been a huge change in the type of people that run for office from when I was growing up and the people now. I mean, nowadays, it's it's a pretty hateful environment, honestly. But back then, you had some pretty inspiring people that were running for office. And so I think I looked at them as a kid growing up and then young, uh, right out of college, as people I looked up to, people um, that were trying to do good work and trying to, you know, pass laws that would help the country. And I so I think there was a little bit of that Oh my gosh! There are these big figures. They're 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 nationally known. Um, but the more I was working with them, the longer I was in the business, the more I realized, you know what? They are regular people too, and mm -hmm. and that they have their own hopes and aspirations. And when you work for them, you really do. They place so much trust in you to tell their story, and so and to do it well and to help them help them win. I mean, ultimately, it's nice to win awards, um, but you really want to win the elections to help them in their career. And so you just realize that they have families, they have kids, that they have their own dreams. And so you get to know them as people and, and that, so I, I enjoyed that part of it. Um, and I think what I liked most about and why I ended up staying in this business is that it's a chance to help bring change to the country, but, and to do it in a way that makes people care. And mm -hmm. like I said, most political advertising just really isn't very good, but when you can figure out a way to tell a candidate's story or to talk about a particular issue in a way that hasn't been done before, to me, that's the challenge. And that's what keeps it interesting. Like, how yeah. do you how do you do an ad about health care when you've made when you've seen hundreds and hundreds of ads about health care? Or how do you do something about assault weapons, um, which is such a you know horrific thing in our society? How do you do an ad about that that will people will want to watch? And so I did an ad for a guy running for Senate in, in Missouri where he assembled an assault weapon blindfolded and and that showing comfort with the weapon helped him run in Missouri, which is a very conservative place. It showed he wasn't an alien national Democrat who hated guns, but it also has allowed him to talk about issues like gun, re gun control and gun reform. And we ended up getting millions of views. The ad went viral. And so I think it's that intersection of Hey, what do we have to, what's the challenge here? How are we trying to help this person get elected? And how can I make an ad that hasn't been done before? Um, yeah. And I've done all sorts of crazy things. It's also just helped me, you know, I've, I've had a candidate jump out of an airplane. I've had one bungee jump. I've had one swim in the Hudson river when it was 12. Like with years. a banner, like vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was hard enough just getting this candidate just to be able to do the jump again. She had jumped back in jump school 40 years earlier. So no, no banners, but um <laughs> But, you know, I've had somebody, you know, drive a snow machine on the frozen Arctic Ocean. It's like all to make a point, right? You you have a political point to make. But how do you do it in a way that's interesting? And that's what's kept me going. Yeah. And, and kind of telling that story, I remember um, watching a, I don't know if it was a documentary or it might have been like a CBS Sunday morning, but they were profiling NFL films. And I would never forget the quote that the founder of NFL films uh, said, and it's kind of like their operating mission. It's tell me a fact and I'll learn, tell me a truth and I'll believe, but tell me a story and it'll live in my heart forever. So like the whole idea of like figuring out, you know, yeah, okay, I want to win, right? Yeah, this is what my platform is, but like finding that inner thing that'll connect with everybody, right? That's the kind of the key to doing what you do successfully, I would imagine. It's it's so true. I mean, I feel like we're hardwired as human beings to listen to a story. I think it comes from being cave people around a fire and, you know, the, people would use verse and lyric, song and storytelling. And I think people just kind of lean in a little bit more when you're telling a story. And so I like, to me, I like my ads. The ideal 30 second ad tells a story beginning, middle and end. And a campaign will tell a story with all those ads together over the course of a campaign. That's the best advertising when you can tie everything together into a story, because otherwise it's just politics. Right. And people don't mm -hmm. really like politics. Um, we have a very resistant, um, you know, consumer. Um, most other people that you talk to, you know, they're, they're creating movies or advertising and uh, that people actually, they might need to buy a car and they're kind of intrigued by a certain car, or they like to watch a movie, like a story. Most people can't stand politics. 
So how do you get them engaged? And what's the story you can tell that will sort of get the person watching thing? Okay, I understand that person. Now right. I know why they're running. Or now I, I can see they're a real human being. And so, yeah, it's all about storytelling. And I love that quote. I'm going to try to remember that. Yeah, it's, it, was, it, res, it really resonated with me. You, um, you talked about how being in this business for so long, how you've seen things change, particularly with politics. And it's, it's really interesting. I was... I was actually having this conversation, this particular what I'm about to ask you, conversation with another friend of the show, um, like maybe a week ago, um, offline, someone who's been on the show multiple times. And we were talking about just how different politics is now from when just when we remember it when we were in our early 20s, first learning to vote, or just, you know, even when we were kids and how it's become more of like a sport almost. And, and it's almost as though, um, the many of the folks who run for office and take office aren't necessarily interested in policy making, but it's almost like politics has become the new reality TV. Like, oh, I want to be famous. Well, Hollywood seems really far away. Don't know anybody who can get me onto a reality show. But wait, I live in a relatively small community. And if I win, as long as I say something, right? It's kind of like the Jaja Zsa Gabor effect. As long as I say something slightly outrageous, I'll be in all of the papers all of the time. That's And that's just my perspective as a political outsider. Tell me a bit about just kind of the shift that you've seen in your time in the industry. Sure. When I first got in, and this really makes me sound, I guess, as old as I actually am, there, there really wasn't, there was no internet. Um, you had three or four major channels in the media market. Um, cable was a new medium uh, with more and more channels, but it wasn't even like it is today. And so when you made advertising, for instance, you would run ads at the, on the six o'clock news and the 11 o'clock news and everybody would see your ad. You couldn't miss it. You'd buy what we call roadblocks and, you know, you had no way of missing the ad. And so it didn't really have to be creative. And What's a roadblock? Meaning that you would buy the six o'clock news at like six ten p.m. on all three channels, and Got so it. if people are watching the local news, they couldn't help but miss. They couldn't help but see your ad. Got um, it. And so back then, the advertising, and I'm bringing it back to that, but I get your larger point, and I'll, I'll talk about that too. The advertising was kind of transactional. Right? Like I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. I mean, and there were attack ads back then when I first got involved. Um, and so th there was, there was still negativity in politics. And back then they used to, everybody used to always blame negative TV ads. Um, it's, it's a lot more bad elements in politics now than just negative TV ads. And so then I saw, you know, suddenly there were more cable channels that mm -hmm. meant that people had more consumer choices. They could, they could change the channel. And then when the internet came, Back in the 90s, when Bill Clinton was president, everybody talked about the information superhighway and how great this was going to be, that you could you could learn anything on the Internet and talk to anybody on the Internet. Well, we've all now seen, actually, there's a real dark side to the Internet, and especially social media, and that has taken over campaigns um, and is now one of the dominant influencers in a race. The advertising that we as uh, on the campaign side will produce, we can have an effect on a race for certain. But it's that whole surrounding noise machine that can really, especially at the presidential level and in some key Senate races across the country where they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars sometimes, that that social media, internet mix of, of, of hateful commentary, but also sometimes stuff will go viral that's actually quite positive. That's now driving the whole conversation. Mm -hmm. And- it's it's radically different. And so it leads to exactly what you're describing with people that get elected because they see it as like a reality show. There, we, one of our clients is really terrific, a new Congress member named uh, Jeff Jackson. And he's down in North Carolina. And he's only able to serve one term because they just gerrymandered his congressional seat, which means the Republicans that control the North Carolina state legislature changed all the district lines. They made it impossible for him to get elected. And so now he's running for attorney general. But what Jeff has done is he does, he's on Instagram. He gets 20 million plus views every time he puts a video on where he talks about Congress from behind the scenes. Like what, what's going on as a new member of Congress, what he's seeing. And he talks about the people that you're describing. 
he'll say there are certain members and he never even says what party they're in, although everybody kind of knows they're usually Republicans that he's talking about. Um, sorry, I hope this is a somewhat partisan audience. Um, <laughs> and he'll describe them. He'll say he won't say who it is. He'll just say this is somebody you've seen and they're very outrageous. He goes, whenever the camera is on, they'll be outrageous. And they'll just it's all about getting clicks and views. But he said as soon as the camera turns off, they're actually some of them are quite serious and want to actually, you know, talk about legislation or try and get something done. But as soon as they know the camera's on, they become outrageous again. And so it's just interesting. They're drawn to it because of the sort of the star power that they get and all the celebrity that comes from it. But they some of them actually do want to actually work on an issue and try to get something done. But to just keep the cameras turned off and they're they're reasonable people. Yeah. Well, how with all of this additional noise that we have now, how does that change, you know, like your internal metrics? Like, how do you define, oh, this was a successful campaign versus, say, 20 years ago? Well, the, the measure of success hasn't changed. It's do you win the campaign? Did they win? <laughs> right? So that's the best <laughs> That's the one good thing about this business as opposed to selling Cheerios, right? Like, you know, okay, great. You get 1% more market share and everybody's real happy. We know if we won or we lost, right? We have a finish line. And so that hasn't changed. What has changed is, first off, how long the campaigns last. Um, sometimes for some races, you'll be on the air for close to a year. It didn't used to be that way. It used to be people would go on the air, start advertising in the summer before the election. Now they can stretch much earlier than that. Um, that's that has changed. Um, I think just the overall constant campaign that's going on is is is, is different. And so it's you know everything is partisanized now. Everything comes down to what are the Republicans and the Democrats. You know how are they going to attack each other on it? Like right now. We're talking about immigration reform, mm -hmm. something that we've needed to do in this country for decades. Um, how do we humanely deal with the fact that so many people are trying to get in the United States? How do we help them, you know, escape w horrific conditions that they're escaping from? Yet a lot of them end up coming into the country as undocumented. How do we deal with this problem? Well, finally, there are senators, Republicans and Democrats right now who have reached the, uh, the uh, parameters of agreement to actually fix a lot of this problem. But Donald Trump says, no, I want this to continue to be a problem so I can beat Joe Biden on the issue of immigration. So now he's threatening these Republican senators and they back down and they're, they, you know, then now they won't pass this compromise legislation. So I think that that's one of the biggest differences. It's nearly impossible to get anything done anymore because both partisan sides have, you know, they're entrenched. And right. they just feel like they're not going to compromise on anything. They know their demands are probably unrealistic, but they think that the other side has unrealistic demands. So nobody can ever agree on anything. And then you got someone like Donald Trump, who just is constantly stirring the pot and creating controversy and 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 uh, just inflaming his supporters and and inflaming the other side, too. It's 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 really a nasty mess right now. Yeah. And it, it almost feels kind of like a little like blood sport. Like it's almost like it's not even, you know, it's almost just like, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're Red Sox, I'm Yankees, go team down with your <laughs> team. Right. So as you're like creating ads, like, so what is that like? Like, do you, do you find that it's harder to maybe you know, again, I don't know how you do your market research and all that, but do you find that it's harder to kind of turn like, you know, a potential voter onto a candidate versus or off of the candidate? Because it, it almost seems, again, from my perspective, that just it's all like an echo chamber. Like what? if you're like a liberal, if you're a Democrat, it's like I'm Democrat. I'm voting Democrat regardless. I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm Republican. I'm voting Republican regardless. You, you've just described exactly what's happening now. So it used to be um, I had a lot of success in what we call red states. And by the way, the whole you know sports analogy, it's like red jerseys versus blue jerseys, right? You know, all the conservative states are seen as red, liberal, progressive are seen as blue. It, I used to get a lot of work in states like North Dakota, where you had enough people that would vote Democratic if they liked the candidate. And so the whole game was about 
you didn't worry about the 40% that you knew were going to vote for you. And you didn't worry about the 40% that you knew were going to vote against you, no matter what you worried about that 20% in the middle. And you tried to convince them and they, and they've been called moderates, independents, up for grabs voters, meaning that their vote is up for grabs. They call them all sorts of different things, but they, it used to be that you could talk to the middle. And, and, and convince them. And so I, for instance, um, I helped win a Senate race in North Dakota with a woman named Heidi Heitkamp. She was a phenomenal senator, but she only lasted one term because from between 2012 and 2018, it was a six year term, that the state just shifted into Trump category, right? Like all the Republicans became completely hardline Republicans and there was it was impossible for her to win. She couldn't get that middle 20 percent anymore. Um, mm -hmm. so as a result, instead of going after the middle nowadays, a lot of our advertising, a lot of the work of a campaign is base mobilization, which means you try to get the democratic vote to turn out. And so, and these districts have become either very blue or very red. And, and your job now is not to convince the people in the middle is to make sure that all the Democrats turn out. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why you now have these swing states like Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and in a presidential campaign, it's, it's less about convincing the people in the middle, although you have to try and do some of that. It's about making sure that every registered Democrat turns out. So a lot of our advertising is much more along that lines now. It's about base base turnout, base mobilization, as opposed to trying to talk to the middle. Yeah. What do you think it is about Trump that like, because clearly, right, whether you love him, whether you hate him, he touched a nerve. He touched some kind of a nerve in a very, very big way. Like I was actually thinking about this. Like I really think that Trump is the, you know, in the 80s, we had Michael Jackson and Madonna and Prince. Like, I really think that Trump might be, and we, 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 and going back, we don't have that anymore because now, like, this music is everywhere. We don't have just MTV and all that. And, like, I, as I think about that, I really think that Trump might be kind of, like, the last superstar. Like, I can't think of anybody else, you know, since I was a kid who was so big, so larger than life, whose name was on the tip of every tongue around the world and who everybody had a visceral feeling about. Like, you know, like there's not like an ambivalence, like, oh yeah, hmm, I read about him. Yeah, I don't know much about, like a visceral, what do you think it is that that he did? You know, it's always a mixture of timing, right? Like when, what else is going yep. on in the world when this, when this individual comes in on long, what they're talking about, what they're like, what do you think it is that has literally allowed him to capture the world's view? Well, you know, it's interesting when you look back at Donald Trump 30, 40 years ago, he, he was on Oprah Winfrey's show and she was asking him, are you going to run for president? He had some sort of star appeal even then and and he would sort of flirt with the idea of running for president over over the years and so i think first off he's always kind of seen himself as larger than life you know about more than just being a developer he's always fancied himself as being this strong leader so i think he's always first off he's always felt that way about himself then when, of course, you know, having The Apprentice as a TV show, um, one of those early social uh, reality TV shows, he, he they build him as this successful businessman, even though his casinos went bankrupt, his Trump University went bankrupt, his Trump stakes went bankrupt, you know, like, but they portrayed him as this master business person. And so a lot of people watch that show from the mid 2000s into the early teens and so they were they brought up believing that he's this super businessman but he's always been again i'm going to take my parts inside here he's always had a racist undercurrent to almost everything he does i mean there mm -hmm. was the central park this five is the mm -hmm. yeah and and so he you know he wanted to like penalty. his father and it's like in like his father's you know his policies with with his business totally totally exactly right i mean they they were uh prosecuted by the justice department for you know for discriminatory practices as as a landlord so mm -hmm. it goes way back with him and then when he decided he oh well and also it did not help our country that that he was ridiculed when he was thinking about running for president in 2011 2012 he was thinking about challenging 
uh, President Obama. And and Obama was was pretty rough on him at a at a White House correspondence dinner, um, made fun of him. I think it really pissed him off that, you know, here's this guy that that Trump doesn't even think was born in this country is now making fun of him. So 2015 comes along. He decides, OK, this is the time I'm actually going to run. And what he did in that announcement speech, everybody remembers him coming down the elevator. Well, that was the speech, uh, not the elevator, sorry, the escalator. The escalator, That's, yeah. The escalator. That's the speech where he said, you know, ta he talked about Mexicans, mm -hmm. uh, you know, coming here being rapists and drug dealers. He, I think, very successfully tapped into a lot of anger among uh, not necessarily even just Republicans, but sort of disenfranchised Americans of, of, of all political stripes but mostly kind of in the heartland, middle America, in the South, um, where he just kind of scraped off this layer of dirt where it was, and suddenly it was okay to be racist openly. It was okay to make fun of people for being disabled. It was okay to, to, to blame somebody, to blame the other for you not having a job or you, you know, having, you know, being down on your luck in life. And you know, he, he gave people scapegoats. And, right. and and people really, really responded to that. It's just the sort of the undercurrent of our society is just, like we all thought with helping elect Barack Obama that, you know, it was a new a new society, a new America. Right. A, maybe a racially blind America. Well, that that wasn't the case. You know, yeah. I think that that racism was always there. And Trump just figured out how to tap into it but also just a lot of classism. It's not just about right. race, by the way. You know, he makes fun of anybody with, you know, even though he went to Wharton, right? He went to an <laughs> Ivy League university, but he makes fun of anybody with a college education that he thinks is too too pointy-headed and too liberal. Um, the guy has does a master class in how to exploit people's hatred. And yeah. so I think that that's what he did. He took the celebrity and the platform that he had and the recognition that he had, and he exploited it by tapping into everybody's, you know, fears. And yeah. Well, now, very successful at it. Yeah. Well, now that you say it, I realize it, because again, it goes into timing as well. Because now that I think about it, the MAGA is really, right, kind of like the next generation of the Tea Party movement. Remember the Tea Party? And that exactly. happened as a result of Obama yep. being elected. Exactly. So it's just, the, yeah, okay. That makes sense. It's, a, it's, it's all a continuum. And now the Tea Party looks quaint. Right, in right. Comparison to MAGA, <laughs> I mean, you know, one of my favorite ads I've ever made. People ask me, "What's the favorite ad you've ever made?" And, and I've got two or three, but one of them was a guy running for Congress in Massachusetts. He's very, very progressive, very liberal, and his father was uh, was was in the Tea Party, and he, somehow he he would even like pay dues. I don't know where you pay dues to be in the Tea Party, but this guy somehow found out a way. He was extraordinarily conservative. And so I made an ad where it was the father and the son talking about about issues and how different they were. But at the very end of the ad, um, our candidate, his name is Carl Shortino, says, you know, but I still love you, dad. And then his dad <laughs> says, me, me too, son. Like, it was nice that even though they had incredible disagreements and the father, he even admitted like he was a little proud when his son had a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, he said, ah, I was kind of proud of that, even though he, he completely disagreed with him. Disagreed with what he was arguing for. Yeah. 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 So it's just like that's quaint. Nowadays, you you know, people can't even talk about politics at some Thanksgiving tables. Right. I mean, if you have people on both sides of the political divide, you almost just avoid talking about politics now. Yeah. So what's that like when you go back to Alaska? Because you talk about Alaska being a very um, conservative place. I mean, I don't know your family and all that, but you're going to Alaska and you, you've done all this work um, for all of these Democratic candidates. Does that turn into something when you, you go home for the holidays? Or if well, you go I, home for the holidays? No, yeah, my parents, <laughs> my, my parents aren't, aren't, aren't alive anymore. So they, they moved back to, to Washington State, which is where my father was originally from. He got tired of shoveling the driveway every year. Um, so I don't go back there for family reasons. I would go, I, I've gone back quite a bit over the years for work. And I think having that understanding of the libertarian nature of Alaska, it's really not that they're all Republicans up there, but they end up voting very Republican because they're libertarians and they're, they're for smaller government, they're for personal freedom and, and they're very pro oil because, um, mm -hmm. the, the oil industry is a big employer up there. 
and so they are there's just don't a mindset. citizens actually get paid by the oil company like don't you get like a specific amount of money every year from the yeah oil it's company? called the permanent fund dividend they created this thing called the permanent fund where a percentage of the oil royalties that was owed to the state would go into this fund and it's it's been hundreds of billions of dollars. I don't know. It's, they've been spending it down because they're having some hard economic times up there. But the, the, the they, every year, the interest that's earned in that fund gets it gets uh, paid out to all the all the residents. So if you're a family of five or six kid, people with a bunch of kids, you get some years you would get like fifteen hundred dollars per person, two thousand oh, dollars wow. per person. So it was. You know, it's not that much lately, but um, and it's always a hot, real hot button issue. Like, what do we do with the permanent fund? It's going down. Do we keep paying it off to people? But um, yeah, so I would go back and just my understanding of kind of the libertarian nature of Alaska combined with having worked on races all over the country. It was just sort of a chance to take everything I've learned elsewhere and bring it back to my home state and get to work and help elect good Democrats, which is how I helped elect Senator Mark Begich in 2008. I got to help elect a mayor of Anchorage a few times, it worked on other races, House races, Senate races up there. It's always fun for me to go back there um, because it really is, it's home for me. Um, but, and, and now they've changed the rules in Alaska. They have a thing called ranked choice voting, which was why we now have, it's, they only have one member of Congress from, from Alaska in the House. And it's a woman named Mary Peltola, and she's a Democrat. And that she only could win because they have ranked choice voting where you have to pick your first choice, your second choice, your third choice, your fourth choice and the way that new process worked, they finally can elect Democrats up there more easily. Oh, interesting. Do you think that that's something that would work in other states and other communities? I'm, I'm not a big fan of ranked choice voting. The people that live in New York City are familiar with it. Also in San Francisco, they have it where you choose your top five candidates. And my experience is your average voter they can't figure out who they like for their number two, three, or four choice, right? Like they're just not going to pay that close of attention to learn enough to actually pick the top five that they support. So they end up choosing the, the one they like the most, and it's probably re relatively random who they put just in their like second two, 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 two. This guy, this guy, this guy. <laughs> yeah, almost alphabetical maybe. So I just don't think voters... They don't they don't think about politics that way. They don't consume it. Listen, there are some activists that do right. They'll know every single candidate running. But most voters, the bulk of them just don't pay that close of attention. And so I'm not a huge fan of it, but I do like it in places like Alaska where we can finally elect a Democrat because of it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you so do you see having been in the industry for so long? Right. Usually we see cycles right we see like patterns like okay we've been here before so now we're about this is what's going to happen again as an outsider this seems like totally like we're in like totally uncharted territory are there any patterns that you see now that you're like oh this reminds me of 1992 and i i can see that this is kind of where the, the tide is shifting but i have a feeling like in a couple of years it's going to move this way it's I, the short answer is no. Uh, this that no, I don't see this falling into a typical pattern um, mm -hmm. because it's just radically different now. I mean, maybe the closest time of so much unrest and unease is 1968, right? And I was just a little kid. I mean, I don't, I don't personally remember that time. I remember little bits of it, but um, back then you had a lot of angry people. Vietnam War was very divisive. Then you had Watergate come along, and and so there was a lot of upheaval yeah, but all these even, different movements happening yeah exactly but even then the cycles were somewhat similar right someone would get elected in 1976 and uh, like jimmy carter and then the next even numbered year 1978 it's called the midterm elections usually the president's party would then suffer a lot of losses in in congress um that 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 happened very predictably until 2022 like even 2018, right? Trump gets elected in 2016, big backlash against him in 2018. Suddenly Democrats took over the House and the Senate. You can look at 1992, Bill Clinton gets elected. Then in 1994, big backlash against Democratic policies. They tried to national, they tried to pass a national health care plan that empowered a lot of Republicans. So 1994, terrible year for Democrats. Then 1996, well, Clinton won again. 1998, Actually, not not as bad a year for Democrats because of, of the impeachment of Bill Clinton actually kind of helped. Uh, it, it hurt the Republicans that they did that. But most years, 
the year, the cycle after a president gets elected, his his party, usually it's a his, him, uh, get, you know, suffers at the ballot box. But 2022, uh, Joe Biden's party did well in 2022. That was very unusual. Um, right. And so 2024, it's hard to predict. I mean, you've, we've never had a, a, a candidate for president with 91 charged with 91 felonies, right? <laughs> Four criminal prosecutions that, that we're in totally uncharted territory or or Joe Biden. You know, he's guy has gotten a, and I'm a Biden fan. I'm a Democrat, but also I've worked for him for now. I told you earlier how I worked for him back in 1987. Here's a guy. He's gotten a lot done, but he's not given credit for much of it. And mm -hmm. so he's politically weaker than he than you would expect him to be with rise with rising employment and the stock market's doing fine and the economy's doing well we we didn't go into a deep recession you would think when you look at the economy he should be fine but um the reality is he's politically weakened his people judge him on his age you got trump who seems more vital and vigorous um but is politically wounded with with his problems it's who knows what's going to happen. So do you think it's bad PR? Like, should should Biden hire you again? To, oh, to... <laughs> I'll pro I'm going to be helping him, hopefully, on what's called the independent expenditure side, um, which is what I did in 2020 as well. I, I make ads in support of his campaign, but I'm working where we're not allowed to coordinate with the campaign. So I'm making a lot of ads to help him out, but it won't be directly for him. It'll be to help him out. Got it. Got it. What's this like? So, so, so being a, an agency um, that's, you know, focuses solely on um, political ads, like I know it's, it's all very political ads are very regulated in terms of for, on, a, on a variety of different fronts. <clears throat> um, if I were to say, hmm, this is a career that I, I'm, you know, I think would be really interested you know, in, in maybe exploring what are you know what are you know for example if you say are a news agency right like you have certain you know like a journalistic code of ethics that you hopefully learned when you were in j school whether or not they're flouted by certain places that's another thing what what goes into a political campaign ad like what type of things do you have to think about like well this would technically be crossing the line or this would technically like, what do you have to think about in order to say, we're going to release this ad, not only is it going to be successful, but it's also going to follow whatever, whatever code of ethics your particular industry has. People would probably laugh at the idea that there's ethics in politics. But, um, <laughs> and there is a group called the American Association of Political Consultants that does have an ethics code, believe it or not. Um, I don't know that everybody in the, uh, you know, adheres to it. <laughs> Um, there, the, the amazing thing about a candidate ad is you can literally say anything you want. You can lie. You can, you can be sued for defamation, but there's no law that's required. It's, it's freedom of speech. So, so there's no but law. I, restricting. I like, don't vote for him. He's ugly. Yeah. You could say that. And worse <laughs> has been said. Um, but the only requirements on a candidate ad is that it it say who paid for it. So there's that, that disclaimer at the mm -hmm. bottom of the screen. And then uh, in the 90s, they started adding this requirement that you say, I'm so-and-so and I approve this message. And that's only for federal races, U.S. House, U.S. Senate and presidency. Um, other than those requirements, you can pretty much say whatever you want. Now, it, you can, if you lie so blatantly, and Trump gets away with this, but most campaigns, if you lie... The other side's going to hopefully find like a news article that said it wasn't true. And then so you can then counterattack and say, well, that that's been that's a proven lie. That person's a liar. I don't like the word lie or liar in an ad, by the way. I think there are other ways of saying it, but you can call mm -hmm. them out. But, you know, there are really very few guardrails on what people can put in their political advertising, which is why it's gotten so outrageous. Um, right. When and people that want to get into this line of work, there's lots of different ways you can get into it. You can some people have come in from journalism. They decided, oh, I want to stop being a reporter right because a lot of newspapers are shutting down. Unfortunately, like I want to make money. <laughs> yeah, I want to get paid. <laughs> I want to get paid. So they sometimes you'll come in from that angle. Some people will come in from having to work on the field side of a campaign where you're out knocking on doors. Um, the Obama movement really did create a lot of people that came up the Obama organization um, on the field side, and they're now really re highly respected political operatives. So there are different ways to come in. Very few 
pure advertising people end up in politics because it's just a very different sort of ad game. Um, so you don't see people coming in from that direction so much. But usually you work your way up through politics, you work your way up through campaigns, and uh, and then you end up in this line of work. And what the one thing you don't see enough in this industry are people that really understand production, that know how to write a good script. I mean, just because you can write a press release doesn't mean that you know how to write a script or how to tell right. a story on t on video. And so I do wish we would see more people coming into this line of work that are artistically motivated, you know, that understand how to make good film, good video, and combine it with an, uh, an appreciation for politics. That's what I feel like I've had all these years. Um, and there are some like others like me, but not enough. I mean, I, I wish we had more people coming up through the ranks that studied how to make good advertising, that studied how to, uh, that I used to read um, American Cinematographer and Ad Age and Ad Week, you know, because I wanted to learn as much as I could about that side of it. Um, and even in this crazy environment we live in, we do need people that can tell stories and, and help elect good, good folks to office. And that's the kind of folks I want to see end up in this line of work. Uh, last question, and this is my own curiosity. Um, so like, you know, when you're making ad buys, right? So if we think about like the entertainment side, there are guardrails, right? Like, even if it's like, you know, is in broadcast, even if it's basic cable, the end of the day, everything has to be um, go through standards and practices and standards and practices companies like, well, you've said too many F-bombs or, oh, you said this and this goes against what our, you know, advertise, you know, you're, you're talking about something that makes our advertiser looks bad. So we need to change that. When it comes to the, the type of work that you do, is there ever like pushback from the broadcaster, whether it's a street, you know, wh wherever you, you're, you're making your ad buys? I've had pushback when I'm not working for a candidate. I made an ad once about Donald Trump basically running the economy off a cliff. And we shot an ad of a, of a Ford Bronco going over a cliff. Well, <laughs> Ford said, sent a cease and desist saying that's our <laughs> iconic vehicle. Now you couldn't tell it was a Ford because we took all the, all the labeling off of it and everything, but um, they, they were able to intimidate the group that we were working for enough that we only ran the ad for a short period of time. Um, they can get away with that if it's not a candidate, but for a candidate, like even if you put in the logos of a local TV station, they can complain and say, take our logo out of your ad. You know, for like the, if you're showing a little clip from a newscast, they can't, mm -hmm. they can't force it off the air. There's so still standards and practices with a candidate's ads. It's, it's, it's pretty much wide open. You can do almost anything. Um, I did an ad for to help Hillary Clinton that had Donald Trump on the David Letterman show. And it was 27 seconds of the Letterman show, a copywritten broadcast. And the campaign was very c concerned about this. And I said, look, there's precedent. There was an ad that Mitt Romney ran against Newt Gingrich in 2012, where he used Tom Brokaw on the NBC Nightly News for 27 seconds and they could not get it forced off the air. So we'll be fine here. And it turned out what nobody knew at the time was that David Letterman actually, when he saw the ad, he loved the ad. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was Trump. It was Letterman questioning Trump about where all of his ties were made that he was selling, you know, because of uh -huh. the Trump line of ties. Letterman loved the ad. Um, but there was a lot of concern even within the campaign. Oh, can we get away with this? I knew we could get away with it because it's a candidate ad. Um, right. So it's, it's, it's the Wild West. That's so interesting. Well, listen, oh my goodness, you are so fascinating and it's been such a pleasure meeting you and I wish we could continue continue talking, but um, we have advertisers, speaking of- <laughs> <laughs> Gotta pay the bills. we like them. So, so before this we is... go, where can we- I'm sorry, what were you about to say? No, 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 go ahead. Oh, no, is it, where, 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 can, where can we find more about you? Where can we find more about your organization? I don't know if you're really active on social media. Where can we, where can we, where can we learn more about you? The easiest place is just to go to our website. It's PutnamPartners.net. And Putnam is spelled P-U-T-N-A-M, Putnam, like Vietnam. Uh, PutnamPartners.net. Um, I'm on uh, on X, I guess you're supposed to call it now, at uh, Putnam TV ads. Formerly known as Twitter. Formerly known as Twitter. Um, I, I'm not super active on there. I mean, I, I've noticed that I think most of my followers are journalists. And so I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> but uh, but you, you can, I'll occasionally pull, point out an ad or something about politics. But the website has a lot of our past ads. So you can see 
a lot of the work that we've done. If people are curious about to see, hopefully some political ads that are a little better than most, um, they can see them there. Wonderful. Well, it's been such a pleasure getting acquainted with you. And <laughs> Black I Jordan. see you again very soon. And thank you all for listening. We'll see you all next week on another episode of Showtime with Jordan Van Hazel and Friends right here on Hot 702.5 FM, Las Vegas.